I think we have people zooming in from schools like in New York and we have people zooming in from all over. So I'm really excited um, oh, wow. <laughs> about this. I know, I know, but people want it. People want to hear what you have to say, Larissa. Oh my goodness. I know. Um, <laughs> I'm only talking to you. So. <laughs> yeah. Just pretend like you're talking to me. That's perfect. Um, so I'm going to, in one more minute, I'll introduce you yeah. and then we have to catch up later. Perfect. Okay. I'm going to, um, so, so, okay. Let me just get ready to everyone who's here. We're going to start in about one more minute. Um, I actually wrote up a whole bio that I can't find on my desktop now. So that's what I'm looking for. <laughs> Don't even worry. <laughs> I'm a little worried, but, but I'm going to find, <laughs> I'm oh going to find, website. hold you on one sec. Like, you can like, just go to my yeah. website. <laughs> Here it is. Got it. Okay. Okay. So I think we'll go ahead and get started. We have a lot of people here. I'm really excited to have Larissa Bates as our visiting artist today. And I do just want to start off by thanking Marcus Cohn, who orchestrates all of these invitations and Zoom links and, and makes the Zooms happen. So thank you, Marcus, because Larissa and I both couldn't do it without you. Um, and with that, I, I'm just so excited to have Larissa here with us at University of Houston for the day. Larissa was born in Burlington, Vermont in 1981, and she grew up between Vermont and Vara Blanca in Costa Rica. She's had solo exhibitions nationally and internationally, included, including Berlin, Los Angeles, Madrid, Miami, Copenhagen, and she's been represented by Manya Rowe Gallery in New York and St. Augustine, Florida since 2004. Larissa's work has been reviewed all over the place from the New York Times, The New Yorker, Contemporary Art China, Public Art uh, Publication in Korea, as well as El Cultural in Spain. She's been the recipient of the Artadia Award and was named a resident artist at the Lower Manhattan Cultura, Cultural Council. Her work often mines a combination of colonial and neo-colonial Latin American history, as well as autobiography. Her work engages with questions of authenticity, the third space, hybridity, and processes of acculturation, and how one acquires culture and group belonging, and deculturation, the loss of culture and of language. Masculinity and the social performance of family structures are investigated through her work. And with that, Larissa, we're so excited to hear what you have to say. And as questions come up, please feel free to text them into the chat or the question answer, and we'll get to them at the end. And um, I'm going to sign myself off now, but we were, we're all here listening. So thanks, Larissa. See you soon. <laughs> thank, you. thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Dana, for inviting me. Um, and thank you, Marcus, for helping me with all of the uh, web web stuff. Um, I'm just going to go to my slide lecture now. Um, and you know what, I think I just want to make sure that I am sharing my screen. Hold on one second. It's not sharing yet. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad I asked. Okay. Um, Okay, is it sharing now? Yes, it is, perfect. Okay. Although you can go into present, we can see your notes and, and your little things okay. on the side. I'll do play now. Okay, perfect. Yeah, okay, so thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate being here. Um, there's this, this is probably going to take an hour. Um, I have a lot of images. I have about 90 images. Um, and so this is going to be sort of a talk that covers a lot of breadth and not a lot of depth. Um, I sort of, I think each of these topics um, could have its own kind of seminar. Um, and I'm not, I'm also not a historian. So I'll go into a little bit of history, but I'm, um, I just want to really, you know, I'm a lay, I'm a lay person who's interested in history. Um, and I just want to make sure, am I, are these little Zoom boxes with you guys in them hidden? 
Sorry, just want to ask that. We we see a big white box that says transculturation, that's but that's all we see. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. Um, oops. Okay. So, so I have some sort of basic slides with some definitions just to kind of help uh, orient you guys in this conversation. I always loved like seeing definitions when I was a student. Um, and a lot of my work is heavily autobiographical. Um, some of the content of this lecture is quite personal, um, just so you're prepared. Uh, my work is, is very personal in nature. Um, so I'll just sort of summarize this slide, this, this talking about transculturation. So it's the phenomenon of merging and converging cultures, um, either acquiring another culture or losing or uprooting a previous culture. And then there's also this idea of neoculturation where sort of a third culture is created out of this hybridity. Um, and I'm sure many of you have come from family backgrounds where you have really different cultures within your own family and sort of I'm interested in, in any narrative around that space and sort of that confusion um, and just the process of sort of like going back and forth between places. Um, so I should say, I'm, I'm gonna ground you in some pictures from my own childhood in the beginning. Uh, so my my dad was from a waspy family in New Jersey. My, um, my mother was from Costa Rica. Um, and I very sadly lost my mother when I was three months old. So a lot of this work is sort of about how do you understand um, part of your cultural history if you've lost the person, the conduit to that culture and sort of how do you relate to that space? So this is a this is a photo of my parents. My dad's in the pink shirt and my mom's in the dress. Um, and I had a show called um, Mama Lengua, and so it, which is incorrect Spanish. So my Spanish is really terrible, um, and which is something I've always been very embarrassed about. I lived in Costa Rica when I was little. My dad doesn't think I spoke Spanish when I was little, but. It, my family members in Costa Rica think I did, and I'm not really sure what the what the story is um, there, but I was really interested in sort of this, uh, the relationship of how you acquire a language and that it often takes about two years, like if you're trying to learn a new language, it will often take about two years and there's this sort of the concept, um, they call it motheries in language where people will really slow down how they speak to really young children and like make really exaggerated facial expressions and reinforce sounds when the kids are making those sounds. Um, and so mama lengua is, is an anglicized version of lengua madre, which would be mother tongue. So, so sort of in misnaming this group of work, I was talking about that sort of feeling inadequate in my mother's um, Spanish space of just sort of always feeling like uh, very anglified because I grew up in a very Anglo environment. Um, so, so some of the questions that I'm really interested in uh, exploring is how are large social forces lived out within the small intimate family unit? Um, and so this is just the idea of macro cultural psychology. Um, really talks about the idea that the the very small, the sort of micro interactions that we have within within personal relationships, within familial relationships, within friendships, are always mediated by history and much larger social forces than than just our own private individual selves. Okay. So to kind of ground the work, um, I was thinking a lot about I feel like each you know, aesthetics have such uh, philosophical and cultural grounding behind them. And I, I was trying to sort of almost think about uh, my life in kind of three, like a, a Venn diagram of like three different aesthetics merging and coming together. And then like, what would that like middle space look, look like? Um, so my dad, just to back up, my dad grew up in this uh, very white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, waspy, um, New Jersey, upstate New York place. And this is not my grandmother's house. I was just looking, I wish I had a picture of my grandmother's house. I was just looking for kind of a photo online that really um, got at some of the like the materiality of her world. And as a child, I loved her world. Um, I just remember going to her house and she would have like matching twin beds with like 
little like lace coverlets and like um, eyelet, like eyelet pillowcases and little like all the surfaces, like this, this side table here, how it's like so shiny and it has like porcelain things on it. Like I just loved her space um, and, and her kind of aesthetic. And my dad, um, I think he grew up in this kind of world and found, I, I almost feel like uh, in some ways he felt like a bowl in a China shop. Um, and, and he kind of, when, when the um, 60s and 70s hit, he was really excited as many people were. And um, it, my grandmother always tells the story. He, he went to Yale University and she's like, I took him to Yale when I dropped him off at Yale. It was Sunday dinners with suit and tie and sports coats and no girls were let into Yale. And then when he graduated, when I went to pick him up, um, literally the campus was on fire. There, were, there was revolts were going on. He had grown out his hair um, and he shortly, and, and it was co-ed. And shortly after graduating, he joined a band that was like pretty psychedelic in nature and um, open for Frank Zappa. They got booed off the stage, um, but he wore like silver body paint and a cape. So, so he really was trying to develop kind of his own aesthetic. And I was, I'm just interested in how uh, the material possessions we surround ourselves with sort of reflect our sort of inner, uh, our inner lives in some way, or what we're what we're striving, what we're projecting out into the world. So this was a painting I did um, in relation to looking at pictures of my great grandmother on on that side of the family, and sort of looking back at these like you know 1920s like tennis players. Um, so when so all this does come back into my paintings. I'm just sort of giving you the background because it does wind up coming back into the work. So, so when my dad was at Yale, he started, he studied in the art and architecture program um, and I met a group of students who are really interested in kind of experimental living, sort of environmentalists, the back to the land movement, um, which I'd love to, I think you have a, a professor who grew up off the grid and I'm be really curious to talk with you more about that at some point. Um, and, and a bunch of them sort of wanted to think about alternative energy and, uh, you know, many of them, and I, I really do have to emphasize, many of them had come from these lives of privilege. So they had this position where they were, you know, had grown up with enough financial backing that they could make this kind of radical decision. Um, so I just want to acknowledge that. Um, and so they, one of them moved up to Vermont and um, sort of, bought land and divided the land up into parcels and said, if you wanna kind of come up here and make a commune with me um, and we'll all do experimental architecture together and kind of have this like ut utopian creative life style. Um, so this building was called the Demetrodon and the center of the building uh, is like communal space. And then they would all help each other build these kind of apartment like structures off of the center space. Um, and this had communal land and then it had like a windmill that I, I think they wanted it to do sort of wind powered electricity. I'm not sure if it worked out. Um, the water was heated on the roofs um, and you know they were trying to be green in, in a bunch of ways. Um, so so my dad, this was my dad built our house um, and he wanted to sort of have it be like heated, use some sort of passive heating, like building it down into the ground a bit. Uh, this is our house in, you know, just at the very beginning of when he was making it. Um, and there's a stream nearby. So he was trying to have, eventually he tried to have us have hydroelectric power. Um, I didn't have, electricity until he was 10. So it was like he was trying to really be off the grid. We had an outhouse. Um, and the the kind of the aesthetic, his aesthetic sensibility was uh, was like we, well, I can kind of, okay. His his kind of aesthetic was kind of Spartan. So like the, the floors were always plywood. Um, we had like unfinished sheetrock walls for much of my life until he had various, uh, uh, women who came and lived in the house and wanted to like finish some things off. Um, 
And so it was this sort of radical space is very pared down. I think like you would sit on a chair and you would you would like eat your food off of a chair in front of you. So he just he didn't I think his his lifestyle was like kind of the ever a rejection or of my grandmother's kind of world. So he just, he wanted like freedom. He wanted, he was a painter. He wanted to just paint all the time. A big part of the house was a studio. Um, and he did various jobs to support our family um, where he would like, he was did snow plowing, he did stone masonry, he did carpentry. And then, uh, and then in the winters we would go down to Costa Rica where he had a friend who had a cabin and he let him just stay there. So if I was thinking about aesthetics in relationship to sort of cultural values, um, I, I would describe the kind of pervasive ideas of this environment as sort of modernist, secular, um, Thoreauian, existentialist, they were trying to be environmentalists, um, very much from a Western culture, the sort of perspective that you are an individual. Um, you know, if you, if somebody asked of, of sort of somebody who grew up in the West, how would you describe them yourself? They might say, oh, I'm, I'm good at running and I, um, and I'm outgoing and I'm creative, something like that. And um, whereas if you grew up in a, um, uh, what's the word I'm blanking on it right now, but we're in like in juntos, like, like <laughs> in a society that is um, more collectivist. Uh, you would describe, you might ask, you might describe yourself as, oh, I'm a, I'm a loyal daughter, I'm a good friend. You would often describe yourself in relationships to other people. So, so most, uh, many of us who grew up in the States will have been brought up a sort of individualistic way of thinking about ourselves in relationship to other people. Um, and, and I think, uh, you know, he was, he was seeking community. I mean, a, a sort of a commune is seeking community. So seeking more in Juntos, but he himself was more, you know, he had grown up in this individualistic society. And, and again, I just wanna acknowledge the sort of the privilege that allowed him to make these choices. Um, so because, because my mother had passed away, I, he, he raised me. Um, and this, this is a picture of him with some of his paintings. Um, he was a geometric abstract painter, is, con continues to be a geometric abstract painter. Many of his paintings are much larger. Um, and so as an artist, this is what my working space looks, looks like. Um, I felt like I really had to find my own kind of aesthetic and my own kind of uh, of way of talking about my experience that was quite different from his, like I, I needed my own language. So I sit at a desk. Um, I usually surround myself with uh, many books, sometimes family photos, sometimes icons. Um, and there's often sort of an, an aspect of research that goes into the paintings. Um, and then I use really tiny brushes and I, I wrap them up with like athletic tape just so that they're more comfortable to hold. Um, so this is a photo uh, from the Costa Rican cloud forest in Vara Blanca. It's, um, it's really beautiful. And my dad loved nature. So we spent a lot of time just walking through the forest, walking through the jungle, him with a machete and I just follow behind him and he would be bird watching like all, all the time. Um, and this is this is what it looked like in Vermont, the sort of Vermont forest. So it was a, a childhood very rich in in nature. Um, and so this relates to painting in that I think it was probably about an undergrad uh, when I realized like, okay, I finally like learned how to draw. Like I can use this medium to kind of understand and make sense of the world around me, like create images that I feel like I really, really needed to see to kind of make sense of how I had grown up. So I eventually, so for about probably 10 years, I mostly worked on images um, of men and of maternal men. And I was thinking, um, I was sort of struck by the kind of like cisgendered masculinity, the space that my dad had to navigate as a single father um, and how, uh, how sort of rigid and, and inflexible ideas around masculinity uh, can be in a, in a mainstream society. And that was, he wasn't in a mainstream society, but in sort of dominant culture. 
Um, and I was trying to almost like make a creation myth. Um, I was looking at uh, Persian miniature paintings and um, I love the work of Trenton Doyle Hancock, how he has like a whole cosmology of kind of his own characters. Um, I also the artist Layla Ali, um, Shazia Sikander, uh, so Persian miniatures and illuminated manuscripts and kind of these really, really intimate pieces that you, you have a very intimate relationship when, you, when you're making them. So this is, this is a painting of my dad as a stonemason or many of my dads as stonemasons. So it's sort of carrying the burden of the weight of the rock. And then he's got like, kind of like a baby Bjorn on the front carrying a baby. And on the right hand side, it's like my dad having a C-section basically. So, um, so, so I was thinking a lot about masculinity and thinking about the ways that our family had to navigate uh, the construct of masculinity. Um, and I wanted, I wanted this like, almost this like hybrid mother Mary man figure in the work in the work and so I came up with this wrestling character as a mother man and um and so he would he, he had this like whole wrestling world and he would cry these tears whenever he was attacked and that was sort of how he would flood the land around him and that was how he was able to escape uh, persecution and um when I was thinking about masculinity I was sort of thinking about the the aggression and the violence with which uh, uh, masculinity is kind of sanctioned and controlled and so I came up with this kind of like head honcho character who is always trying to take over the world and is very threatened by any kind of deviation from mainstream masculinity and and is violently trying to kind of oppress oppress that um and at the same time so so my now husband who I've been with since uh high school was a wrestler and um and I just remember and he's a very very nurturing person so of course he was like my idea of like okay great I found like a mother man like this is this is what I need in this world like I like this this kind of thing um and I just remember at one point he grew his hair long and I remember my uncle grabbing his ponytail and just saying like cut your hair you look like a damn girl and and sort of that that rigidity around masculinity was just something that that my dad and that my husband and I think all men in our society have to contend with um and I feel like it I'm hoping that it's opening up more and more but um but these paintings were kind of thinking about that space so the head honchos uh were on this imperialist sort of mission to take over the world um and this is these are the head honchos i wish i had a detail of this um but they're kind of dressed up in the davy crockett image and i was thinking about american exceptionalism and kind of um this the ways that that we have been an imperial nation sort of through neocolonialism which uh has a whole legacy in my mom's family which i'll talk about um, and, and so the mother men figure are kind of standing on these plinths and they have like, they have waist just made out of lactating breasts. And then down below them are these head honcho figures who are like hunting, hunting beavers. And I was thinking about like American tall tales, like Davy Crockett and like this sort of folklore of these rugged individual, rugged individualist men. Um, and then the head honcho figures, uh, they would have these little babies and they would just sort of like, they almost would treat them like mold spores where they would just drop them and they would like float to other islands and colonize those islands violently. And like the head honchos were just like loved all weapons and all machines. Um, so, so I kind of worked in this mother men head honcho series for a while thinking about masculinity. Um, and then in, also at the same time I was doing these like kind of Persian miniatures inspired garden spaces and these kind of characters would emerge where it's like the mother man wrestler these little like worried figures that are just kind of worried about whatever's going on um and then this birthday girl figure where it's almost like each each one of the birthday girls is like this is my birthday and it's like 
like this isn't going well and they're kind of always having a tantrum and sort of in this narrative space that I was trying to create the like the mother man like finally the birthday girls can can chill out because the mother man like this is like this angelic mother man like is there and they can like relax and sleep um and then this character the little later hosen boy um is just another sort of manifestation of the early indoctrination into sort of a violent a violent masculinity and here they are like being being like that uh this is a sculptural piece from 2008 um it's like a lactating mother man in the background um these little later husband boys and then there's like a video on the mirror um of of this sort of mother man wrestling world happening another mother man in the background. I think I was looking at Ballet Russe set design. And so that, that, that was inspired by the Ballet Russe set design there. Okay, so, so that was like almost 10 years of sort of going really, really into the channel of, of sort of uh, ma thinking about masculinity and kind of dialogue around masculinity. Um, and then I was trying to sort of learn more about my, my maternal history within Costa Rica. And um, I found when I was digging up a bunch of things, I found that my great grandfather had been an American Yankee from the Northeast, um, from this privileged background who had gone down to Costa Rica and was I think one of the early uh, people who organized uh, and helped start United Fruit Company, which I don't know how many of you know very much about it. I have two slides that are just gonna kind of give you a very brief overview of United Fruit Company, um, but it's quite notorious in throughout Latin America and in kind of the history of um, the multinational corporation. Um, and I'm just gonna like really quickly read through this just so that you guys can be a little bit grounded in this. Um, it's a, an American multinational. Oops, I'm blocking myself with the view of myself. Okay. Um, so a lot of land was usurped um, and networks of transportation were controlled by United Fruit Company throughout Central America, the Caribbean and the West Indies. Um, had the company has had a very lasting impact on economic and political development of several Latin American countries, Costa Rica being one of them. Um, they uh, helped start coups, actual like violent coups in Guatemala and Honduras, both connected to United Fruit Company. The history of the company is quite violent. Journalists referred to the company as El Pupo, which is the octopus, um, and wrote about it in terms of capitalist imperialism. And by 1930, it was the largest employer in Latin America. So, um, so I was just, because I'd been doing so much sort of trying to process and understand like hegemo hegemonic notions of masculinity and privilege. And uh, I was just, I was trying to understand. So this was sort of a, a an imagined portrait of my great grandfather uh, being at Yale um, with the Yale Bulldog in a reading room and uh, with this banana plant behind him and just trying to understand the sort of the sense of entitlement um, that, that came with this background and the sort of sense of um, like to this like young college guy like how did he have this sense like I can just go to another country and like manipulate the social structure of that country for my own personal greed um and it's it's obviously a part of my family history I'm very uh, ashamed of but I feel like we have to um reckon with the ways that we've um our families have had terrible legacies um so this is just another slide to sort of summarize Banana Republic. Um, so archetype of multinational corporation in the 20th century, United Fruit Company specifically was, was an archetype for the different multinational corporations. Uh, it was known for bribing government officials, um, high up people in United Fruit Company um, at various points had access to the CIA. I think there is a, a board member whose brother was the head of the CIA and somebody who had a lot of shares who became Eisenhower's secretary of state. Um, it was known for exploiting workers, terrible living conditions, paying little in taxes to the host countries. Um, it's known for environmental degradation within the host countries, like 
fungicidal dust, all kinds of pesticides, and communal indigenous lands were taken and sold to US multinational companies. So this is the legacy of this company. Um, so, so then I was, I was living in Boston and I looked um, at the Harvard Business School in their library, they have this whole archive of United Fruit Company. And so I went and got to look at the photos from the company's archives. And there were so many pictures of these kind of um, white men in sports, like at golfing or playing tennis and kind of creating these like country club like settings in the midst of their sort of tropical uh, empire that they had created for themselves. So it's just, it just these paintings were thinking about that. Um, there's a tiny little boat here in the water um, that's hard to see, but they had a, a, I think it was the maybe the only private sort of Navy fleet. They're called the, it was called the Great White Fleet. And um, I think that the Bay of Pigs invasion was actually, uh, they used the Great White Fleet in the Bay of Pigs invasion. So just to sort of illustrate the, the closeness with the US government. Um, that the United Fruit Company had. Uh, so there's a boat from the Great White Fleet. Um, and then this was, this painting, I was using an old photograph of my mother's family, I think from like the 1940s um, and sort of like painting them in this like gold, uh, almost like ban banana barren family out having a picnic and, and um, uh, yeah. And so this was, well, this Rissa, can I jump in real fast and ask you a yeah. question? Is that okay? Of With course. the last image and this one you're, you're showing us right now, can you tell us just a little bit about like what kind of paint are you using? What's oh, yes. the general scale, stuff like that. I'm curious. Yes. Uh, so this one is about this big. Um, and I was using gouache paint, um, and gold leaf. And, uh, this is on panel. And this one is about this big, and it's also gouache paint and gold leaf on paper. Um, yeah, so very small scale. So thinking about sort of the narrative spaces of Persian miniature painting. And this, the octopus within the swimming pool is like referencing El Pulpo. Dana, is there anything else that you want to ask? No, no, we'll have more questions at the end. I just thought of it and thought I'd interrupt. Thank of you. No, no, of course. Yes, of course. And so this kind of like this kind of evil face comes back later later on in the work. Um, so 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 I did a series of work around United Fruit Company in particular. And then I also um, was thinking about how um, you know, when you, when you are of two cultures, you is often, you know, because I had lost my mother, I didn't have full access to her culture. So I started thinking about the door as like a threshold, like a threshold I could never quite get through. And my understanding of her is never gonna be fully complete and sort of thinking about this, like the block that you run into. Um, and here's a detail. This is a very small painting. And again, with like these, like, little little brushes um, and lots of details. Um, and so so when after I was born, my my grand my mother's mother, my maternal grandmother, uh, her we called her Mama Mimi. Um, she was the third from the right, no, from the left at the on the top. Um, she really wanted to raise me. And so in Costa Rica, and there was sort of like a custody battle that ensued over me. And, and so I think that <clears throat> the sense of like, we are so completely shaped by culture um, was just brought home to me because I could have like, I would have been a completely different person had I grown up with Mama Mimi in Costa Rica. And she was so different. My, my dad's family values and her family values were really, really different and sort of the way that they interacted with and perceived the world around them. Um, so she was very Catholic and 90% uh, of Costa Ricans identify as Catholic, but that doesn't like really begin to cover like the intensity of the of the sort of religious space that she and my mother's family occupied. It was like a like an all prevailing sense of uh, th that the spirit world and the presence of God or Mary is like 
right here. I was talking to one of my friends about it and she was saying, oh yeah, my, my, the most important person in my mother's life was Mary, like the Virgin Mary, like, like having this sense of it, like a really tangible spiritual life. It's just so different than the kind of like modernist off the grid life I had grown up with. Um, and then also just like that, that collectivism, like that sense of like all those family connections and rather than individualism, like these were paramount in her sort of culture. The idea of famil familismo, um, the dedication, the constant commitment and loyalty to family um, where you like make major decisions and you'd like often, it would be kind of considered rude, I think, if you didn't ask your family for their opinion on things. And as Americans, we're really raised to like, you know, lift yourself up by your bootstraps, go out, make your own decision for yourself. And, and this, it can be kind of a jarring experience because I think for um, you, people like in this sort of individualistic westernized idea, you say like, cut the cord, like just cut the cord. But, but in like, in a Costa Rican family, that would be, I'm very antithetical to the society. Um, so this is a, a painting I did based off of that, that image. Um, and, and here I was sort of turning her hair almost into a veil. Um, and, and just to sort of like illustrate the intensity of the sort of presence of the spiritual realm. Um, I remember my, my aunts always talked about that my mother had had a visitation from Mary. Like she had woken up from a nap and had been visited by Mary. And, and I remember, uh, my husband's now a physician. I remember when he was doing his psych rotation, I was like flipping through his like diagnostic manual. And it was talking about how, um, how if you, if you experience like hallucinations or visions, um, those hallucinations or visions in, in a Western culture might, would be part of the cr criteria or diagnosis of schizophrenia. Um, but, but if you come, but um, visions or hallucinations can also be culturally sanctioned. So culturally or religiously sanctioned. And if you come from a culture where that's part of the culture, then it's just part of the culture. And I was like, wow, like the degree to which you like, how you experience the world around you is completely shaped by what your culture is like had I grown up with Mama Mimi like this this kind of um spiritual life would have been part of my every day like my aunt goes to mass like every day and talks regularly prays regularly throughout the day talks to my mom regularly um and so I was just I was just trying to kind of understand that <laughs> with, with these paintings this is like a place for me to like kind of like understand like just how much we are mediated by our culture. I just thought this was such a beautiful Pieta. Um, and this, the images, these were kind of like the images that were around when I was a kid in Costa Rica, like the Mar Mother Mary everywhere, and jewelry and earrings. And, um, and so this is a portrait of Mama Mimi and Papa Pete. Um, he's, he's of the United Fruit um, sort of neo-imperialist lineage, and then Mama Mimi, and I don't understand this marriage completely, and I and I wish that I had, they're no longer living, I wish I could have asked them about it. Um, so Mama Mimi was uh, sort of a political activist, she was part of the Partido Nacional de Liberación, and I think that that's kind of the equivalent of like a left democratic party. Um, here she is with Don Pepe, who is uh, the president of Costa Rica, who um, won a Nobel Peace Prize for abolishing uh, Costa Rica's army. They nationalized the banks, gave blacks and women the right to vote, uh, guaranteed uh, education for everyone, gave citizenship to blacks, black immigrants and children. And so I, I don't understand the sort of like neo-American capitalists um, with sort of like a, a liberal Democrat activists and I don't like fully understand this relationship and this history so I guess I just have to like not totally understand that um this painting's about this big and it was based on um a photo of my mother my grandmother and my aunt uh, my grandmother wound up being uh the first female ambassador to England. And this is, I think, based on a photograph taken when they were in England. Um, 
And I think it's called something like as Tika, as Macintosh, Manzana is exotifying you, exotifying me. Um, and I was just sort of thinking about the sort of odd place of having, you know, I've grown up and experienced my life predominantly as a white Westerner. And so sort of my way of understanding my mom is, uh, I feel like I kind of like fall into the process of almost like exotifying her and her, her culture and her place, which is just like a really weird way to experience your own family history or it's sort of exotifying and idealizing it in some ways. Um, and then I was thinking about like, like, so when I had my daughter, I named her Pilar. I would only speak to her in Spanish for like the first three years of her life. My brother Juan, who's my half brother, um, he really wanted like his kids to have sort of like anglicized names. So I was just thinking about like how it's like we each are looking elsewhere for almost like a sense of an identity. And my mom, her first name was Patricia del Carmen. And as soon as she married my dad, she wanted her name to be Patty Bates, like really short. So I was just like thinking about this like cross pollination, like what we what we want to cut off of ourselves, what we want to put on to ourselves. Um, and the sort of uh, birthday girl morphed into this like Chiquita banana girl sort of like trying to touch this this maternal sort of female lineage and space which I like haven't had access to and then this is a picture of uh, my grandmother making the clothes she made all the clothes for her daughters excuse me when they went to England so she would sew all of their clothes um, and then in the corner there's like this like imperialist head honcho and then there's like little images of my dad carrying this rock and this baby on his front and the yellow bulldog is kind of like scattered throughout the background. Um, so so motherhood was very fraught for me. Um, I, I was like, I was like, okay, like, I, I think I felt like I was like, I solved it. I got this like mother man who's gonna like be the mother to my kids. Great. Like, I just the idea of, of motherhood felt sort of like sub, subliminally quite dangerous to me. So I think I just started to like try to paint as like, okay, what, what, what is a mother? I don't really understand. Um, and and sort of like this ben Chiquita banana girl, she's like in the space, but she's not sort of of the, this sort of maternal lineage. Um, and then I was like, Laura Ashley matching mom daughter dresses. <laughs> like I was just like sort of trying to mine like cultural imagery. I really I knew I wanted to have kids, but I was like quite wary of it and and worried that something would happen to me if I did have kids. Um, so this is. Uh, my mother and my grandmother. Um, and so when I was trying to sort of create a, a visual language to explore this like history of colonialism and neocolonialism, um, I saw this show at the MFA that I that was kind of like very eye-opening for me. And it was it was looking at colonial art um, in the early Americas when it was under the Spanish crown. Um, and so much um, so much silver was being mined out of the Americas that th that that amount of silver actually crashed whole economies like the amount of greed the taking of the sort of natural resources of the new world like bankrupted people um and so I was thinking about um this was a time when there were these ships that would go from Spain to the New World and then from the New World to East Asia to um, the Philippines. And they would collect all kinds of products for export back to Spain and back to the New Worlds. And so images, these sort of hybrid first global objects were starting to be created. So this, I think on the left is a porcelain, I believe made in China out of porcelain. And then it was very fashionable because it was like um, a status symbol to have objects from East Asia. Um, and so artisans in the Americas would try to imitate the styles of these objects made in Asia for export to the New World. And so on the right, I believe is a piece of Talavera pottery where they didn't have white porcelain in, in the New World. And so they would they would use an, sort of earth colored clay um, and then paint it white and then do the blue and white patterns on top of that or do the blue on top of that. And so these new hybrid objects were made in this colonial process. Um, and so I was, again, just this moment of hybridity. Um, 
And this, this is a screen made in Japan depicting the Portuguese landing in um, Japan. It was called S Southern Bar Barbarians Come to Trade. Um, and then this was a screen made in uh, the, uh, the Vice Royalty of Mexico um, or like the, of New Spain, um, an imitation by artisans within the Americas of those Japanese screens. And so I was just interested in the really subtle shifts when, when like the, the process of a, like cultural appropriation happens, like there's these little shifts and then like suddenly a new object is born. So when you're looking at this, like these clouds, you know, they, they repeat, there's like a pattern that's going like straight across the middle of this Biombo screen. Um, and there's like a texture in the clouds. And then some of the painting style looks like it's like very European in like the way the trees are depicted and like sort of the light and shade. Um, but then there's also a lot of the flatness kind of imitating the Japanese screens. So here's another, this is a detail of a different Biombo screen. Um, and I was just, I was just interested in this moment and this like this moment of extreme greed to the point where like you've, you know, it's like a very violent greed. Um, and then it's like kind of bankrupted yourself, like that degree of greed. Um, and so this cloud, the sort of dimensional cloud, I wound up using in this series of um, invasive species gardens, where I, I read this essay by Jamaica Kincaid, um, where she was talking about growing up in Antigua, and she was taught to memorize a Wordsworth poem, and, and she was set about daffodils, and she'd never seen a daffodil. They didn't grow where she was living. And she was talking about, you know, this sort of this Western history of, with colonization, um, how education becomes a tool of sort of reinforcing constantly looking towards the West. So I was thinking about these daffodils as a metaphor for, as, you know, parts of my own family with my own family's neocolonial history, um, this invasive species. Um, and then on this Biombo cloud, you know, taken from this time of um, sort of colonial hybridity and violence. Um, so I created a bunch of these invasive species gardens. Um, and this is another example of uh, a type of hybrid painting that was made in the Americas where artisans, um, either Spanish or indigenous artisans in the Americas were trying to imitate uh, products being imported from Japan. So there's, there were boxes like Japanese lacquerware that would have inlaid mother of pearl and that became fashionable. And then the artisans within the Americas began painting with mother of pearl. So, um, so this is all like getting to the background of this little character I'm about to show you. So, so then I was reading about like the history of purple and this particular color, this particular shade of purple called I think Tyrian purple. Um, it was considered, it was like a, a royal color um, back from the Phoenicians uh, and it's made from the mucus secretion of a predatory mollusk. So I was interested that this color came about from a prey, like, like something preying on another thing. Um, and it was considered best quality when it was the color of clotted blood. Um, and so I kind of I kind of blended the daffodil with this Tyrian purple and with the Chiquita banana brand. And now I just wanna play a very quick clip for you of the Chiquita brand commercial that was made in 1944, but let's see if I can even do this. Okay, I'm gonna share my YouTube screen with you. Um, put that down. In share, new share, Shahida Banana Brands. Okay, can you see the Chiquita Banana Brand screen? Yes, we can. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So this is a very problematic commercial um, in terms of the exotification of others, in terms of, of minstrelization. Um, all kinds of problems. And this was made by United Fruit Company in uh, 1944. And I think it was, I think it was one of the early um, commercials, I think. Um, for... 
I'm Chiquita Banana, and I've come to say bananas have to ripen in a certain way, and when they're flecked with brown and have a golden hue, bananas taste the best and are the best for you. You can put them in a salad. Grief? No, not yet, my dear. That greenish way you're looking means that you are ripe for cooking. How about me? No, no. When you are fully ripe, my dear, those little flecks of brown appear. You're most digestible, my friend. Delicious, too, from end to end. You can put them in a pie. Any way you want to eat them. It's impossible to beat them. But bananas like the climate of the very, very tropical equator. So you should never put bananas in the refrigerator. Bananas are a solid food that doctors now include in baby's diet. And since they are so good for baby, I think we all should try it. See, 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 see. Okay. So now, new share back to. this. Did that work? I, yeah, it did work. Actually. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, so um, yes, so then, so then I sort of combined those images into this figure of, um, so the, so it's the Tyrian purple, it's the face of the Tequila banana brand, um, the Chiquita banana, and then also the reference to the essay on daffodils and those are sort of this invasive species. Um, and then I also was interested in um, uh, using mother of pearl because it had been had this sort of colonial history. Um, so I made these this form called a yappa spark. And um, the yappa spark sort of originated with a story I heard um, from the curator of this show um, at the MFA in Boston um, talking about colonial America and this huge silver mine that was in Bolivia, um, this town called Potosi. And it's this huge, huge mine. And I think, um, I think that the mine itself maybe supported the Spanish empire for two centuries. It was a huge silver vein. And I think that over the history of the mine, I think, um, 8 million people uh, died in the mine or, or accidents around mining. So it was a huge human cost. Um, and, and so just sort of thinking about the, the extreme of human greed, of how violent and how far human greed will go. Um, and so there's a story that the curator was talking about where the, the actual, the thoroughfare, the main thoroughfare in the town of Potosi was paved in silver. So there's such an excess of mining. Um, and the colonial families would ride horses, per, like do parades down this thoroughfare. And when the horses hooves would hit the, the silver pavement, um, little sparks would fly off of their hooves. And these sparks were the, the Quechua, the indigenous people would call these sparks the Yapa, the Yapa. And so I was thinking about how much colonialism um, and neocolonialism really act as a cancer on a place. So it's like almost like a tumor where it goes in and it siphons off your own water systems, um, your own circulatory system and just feeds itself. And, and this, the Yapa spark character is like this, this neocolonial, almost like a tumor. And, and this facial expression, I think you saw in an earlier painting where like the tennis players are kind of like having this evil, facial expression, this like e evil, greedy facial expression. So, so the, I think I covered a lot of the background and now I can just sort of quickly run through the paintings. So you can see there's the Yappa Sparks, the Chiquita Banana Girls, and then the, um, the daffodils. Um, oh, right. So, so at the same time as sort of this colonial history I was interested in, I was also interested in the sort of maternal space of my, of my mother's family. And um, this is my aunt Sylvia, this is her, uh, 
her engagement photo from the newspaper. And this is um, Carolina Herrera, the, the fashion designer, um, who just sort of reminds me of Sylvia's style. Um, and then uh, I just have like a, an anecdote about meeting my aunt Sylvia. So, so I had gone from this like very off the grid life. And when I was in, I got to go to boarding school for two years um, for my last two years of high school. And I was so excited. I thought like, if I went there, like somehow I would become like Nancy Drew. <laughs> um, and so I got this, I just was excited to like, kind of see what like mainstream world was like, obviously it was a very privileged mainstream world, but I was just like excited to kind of get life outside of this like sort of very hippie world, which I love the hippie world, but I was curious about the rest of the world. Um, and so when I was at boarding school, my Tia Sylvia, my mother's sister, called me and I hadn't really met her. Her husband was my um, godfather. She called me and she's like, hello, darling. I'm having a 21st birthday party for your cousin Nicholas. Um, could you come down to New York? And I was like, of course, I was so excited. Um, and she's like, and do you have a gown? And I really didn't have a gown. Um, and so I was like, yeah, I have a gown. So I had like a cashmere sweater that my friend had given me that I'd accidentally shrunk in the wash and I had like a fake suede skirt from Hot Topic that was like kind of fraying. So I like took the Peter Pan bus down to New York. I bought some huge platform high heels um, in Penn Station and she was putting us all up in a really fancy hotel. And, and I was like, I love this whole world. Like, what is this? And, um, and so I remember I got my own room in the hotel and I like ate the whole mini bar because I didn't know that you had to pay for the mini bar. Um, and, and I got into my outfit and I like, I was very gawky, gangly teenager with braces, pimples, like the whole thing. And I remember like going down to her room, and, like knocking on her door and she had like this, a suite and she like opened up double doors and she's like, oh darling like let me help you and and she's like I will help make you over and I felt like almost like one of those like movie scenes where it's like you get to like have this whole transformation and so she took me into her bathroom and she just had like makeup everywhere and everything was so shimmery and like her whole outfit her earrings matched her necklace everything was just like um, an amazing new aesthetic it was very different from from my life with my dad um and she took all of my hair upside down, she brushed it and my hair is curly. So it sort of just like went into like this shape. And then we went to this birthday dinner and it was like the first time I had met my godfather, um, my, um, who my mother had known really well, um, my uncle. And so we got up to this like private dining room and he comes up to me and he had like a three piece suit a little scarf in his pocket and a monocle. And he, he looked up at me and he goes, oh dear God, get me a drink. <laughs> and I was just completely devastated. Um, but also, and then my brothers sat across from me at the dinner and they were like growling, like, you look like a lion, like Grr! <laughs> the whole time. Um, and so, so when I was starting to sort of like trying to understand this, this sort of Latina, Costa Rican, female space. It's been my mother and three sisters and they're cl very close to their mother um, as opposed to I had I had um, all brothers and my dad and so I was like trying I was like trying to make sense of this like real dichotomy um, and not to say all that gender is a binary at all um, but I was just like trying to make sense of this like particular piece of my family history. So so grooming became a big theme in these paintings and then um, this the star shape was actually taken from pictures of Estee Lauder makeup compacts. And it, again, here is like, here's another series of women all together. The one in the middle is pregnant and the Chiquita banana girls are like kind of in the space. They're kind of an iteration of the birthday girls but they, they don't totally belong. So it's just imagining this sort of like collectivism, this like sense of this like collective community. And with familismo, it's like you probably would live like right next door to your family and for many generations. And if you had kids, like people would help you. And um, I have a friend who's, uh, Guatemalan and we were just lamenting sort of raising our kids in the west and like um how lonely it is like you just wind up like alone in your apartment a lot and and sort of thinking like gosh like you know had I had this like other life there's like 
it's sort of a lot more sort of social support. Um, and, and Olga was talking, my friend was talking about, she's like, it's almost like there's hands that like guide you and shape you and then like are there to hold you. So this like image of these hands, like there's like maternal hands. Um, and then uh, um, we, let's see. Okay, I can, I can kind of fly through these last slides. So I was so worried that like, so my, my mother had had cancer while she was pregnant with me and I was so worried that if I had kids, somehow the same thing would happen. And I, I actually really sadly was diagnosed with cancer shortly after having my daughter, but thank God it was cured, it was treated. Um, and so also the hair sort of like falling out, um, just like the hair became like really emblematic of me. And I remember my doctor was Dominican. And so I just sort of, this was talking about that. Um, and then I was thinking about like the Pantene Pro-V commercials with those like the sort of like amazing nurturing caps that would go into hair. So these are almost like chemo or, or like Pantene Pro-V caps sort of both at once. And then in the background, there's the Yappa Sparks. And I was thinking about um, just the legacy of literally poison poison left behind, um, you know, by United Fruit Company. Um, and, uh, and the process of, so this is like called two ubumes um, and uh, I think something like with a gestational carrier. So ubume is like a, I think a Japanese myth where there's, there's a deceased mother who leaves little candies for her children in the forest. Um, and, and this is sort of a picture thinking about my brothers having been left behind um, without a mother. They're my half brothers. And so their dad was Costa Rican and my dad um, also helped raise them, but just sort of thinking about their dyad. Um, and then like these, these like scaredy lions as like a symbol of that. Um, and then this piece, the hair dryer, this is a slightly larger piece for me. The hair dryer is like almost like a phone cord. So it's like thinking about primates and like how much oxytocin is released in the grooming process when you groom each other. And like the phone cord, like that was always like, that's how I could connect with my aunts was like calling them. Um, and so, and then just like this memory of like her having groomed me and how impactful that was for me. Um, these sort of women in the, again, up against the threshold, like not being able to kind of access this maternal space. Um, the Yappa spark in the center, these, the, the same, the daffodil character sort of like spewing out um, potentially pesticides a little bit, I was thinking of. And then this is just a close up space of this like really intimate space with these arms that can catch you and these like Pantene Pro V capsules. <laughs> um, Again, a lot of the same themes. This one is about this big. This is from photos of my grandmother when she was an ambassador. Um, and then I was thinking about sort of my idea of motherhood. I was so fearful of it. And so I was thinking about, you know, I was fearful on kind of like a subconscious level that like the process of motherhood could be uh, life-threatening. And so I was thinking, um, sort of having these like these children and like you know just like really hoping to stay in one piece and I've been very fortunate and I have two beautiful children and I'm healthy and well um but but sort of like thinking about like what does somebody take on when they you know when they give birth and it's is I'm so grateful for what I have um but I feel like uh I feel like there just needs to be more room for sort of like the the full cost of motherhood and it's such a gift but it's also you know, can be really hard on a person's body and just for there to be room for the full complexity of that. Um, and these ones, this is called Poochie Mamas. And I just remember I had like this hippie wedding up in a meadow and we said like everybody wear hiking gear and like Tia Sylvia like had on a whole Poochie outfit. And I was like, yes, she's like my, my style icon. Um, and this, this is like with Tia Sylvia on the phone. This is just a close up of that. Um, and just sort of thinking about like almost your body becoming like furniture after having kids. This is called bubble gum tum yum yum yum. And it's like, like what happens to your belly after you have kids is kind of amazing. It becomes a very like comfortable place to rest. <laughs> um, and this one's called the after party. Um, and it's, it's, I was, 
again, this like very glamorous sort of Latina femin femininity. And I don't mean to be um, over uh, essentializing sort of there's like, of course, Latina is a huge plurality and this is not a universal experience at all within my mother's family, like makeup and how you dressed and made yourself up was really important. Um, and so sort of, I was both really curious about the, um, this is a detail of that, of the glamour of her family, but then also the really deep desire to see like the human, the full human and like the flesh and like the random hairs and the pimples and like, um, just like being able to like actually see, see those aspects of, of the full person. This is based on uh, when my grandmother was an ambassador, kind of like a new iteration of her with her three daughters and Papa Pete. Um, uh, this was based on a boarding school, sort of thinking about each of these little rooms with these like beige telephones that would have a little light that would come on um, if you had a message. And so they were each kind of in their like abstract room area um, with their roommates um, and grooming and then they could like call each other from these phones. Um, this is from last, this is made during the quarantine um, when I was just stuck uh, home with my children who I love very much, um, but just sort of feeling like I'd almost become like a, a laundry line and, um, and, and like a play structure, like a jungle gym and a laundry line all at once. <laughs> and uh, this is the last slide. This is just of my dad, I think it's called El Guido or Viudo, it's um, the widow, the widower. And this is sort of me merged into my dad's, uh, you know, physical space, sort of like our bodies as one. So, okay, I did it. I'm sorry I went over time. Now I can, now you all can come back. Hi, Larissa. Hi. That was so wonderful to see. I really feel like I learned so much about you and your work and it was just fantastic. And I want, I have a lot of questions personally, but I wanted to start with student questions. Um, actually, we're going to start with a question by, by another painter, Vera Ilyatova, who, oh, wrote, <laughs> who wrote into the chat, your paintings tell amazing stories with complex layers of narrative structures. Do you have a writing practice where you write down these stories before they make it into the paintings? Oh, hi, Vera. I can't believe you're here. That I'm so honored that you're here. Um, I, you know, I just do a lot of notes. So I don't have like a, a I just do like random notes on random pieces of paper, like all over the place. So I don't have like a formal, a formal writing practice, but I have like little scraps of paper all over the place. Um, and I, I would love to get back into journaling. I think that would be helpful, but for now it's just a lot of notes everywhere. Is it the same, is it the same approach to, because a follow-up to that that I was wondering about is like how you formally put together your paintings. They're so complex, like you're involving patterns and imagery and narrative. Do you sketch things out ahead of time? Do you have a sketchbook or do you kind of work it out? What, what's your process with that? Um, yeah, sometimes, I mean, the sketches will be like this and the, they're also just like on random pieces of paper. Mm -hmm. So I'll sort of like sketch out a person um, and um, on just random things, I'm like trying to find them. There's usually like piles of them. I, I'm not at my actual studio, I'm at home. Um, so, so I'll just like sketch out ideas and then, and then I'll usually work on a painting until I get stuck. Like I'll get, I'll like run into places where I'll get stuck and then I'll start a new painting. So I often will have like three or four paintings going at the same time. And I kind of am going between them for so for whenever I get stuck I can just go right to the next one um and I look at tons of images like when I showed you the desk um right. you know surrounded by picture books they have like a, a wonderful stack of books in my space I love going to the library and just like getting art books I look online at things so I'm always looking at a lot of different images so it's not like you have a very formal prepared drawing that you're then transferring onto a panel no, right. No. Okay. That's very interesting and helpful, I think, for students to hear, you know, how you go about this. So you're willing to like add and change things around as you're working. 
Yes, and I make many mistakes when I'm making them and that that um, that I either roll with or cover up or put something else on top of. Um, so so it's, a, it's, it's like a, they kind of grow and shift when I'm making them. Right. I love that. So you, you kind of don't know exactly what they're going to end up looking like. So interesting. Not okay. at all. Yeah. Not at all. <laughs> um, okay. We're going to bounce around. Is that okay? That's Just great. Yeah. Okay. The next question is written in by Emily. It says a lot of the paintings are framed in the gold leaf, but the imagery tends to break the frame. Can you please talk more about the significance of framing or lining the painting in the gold leaf or even the constant theme of gold leaf in your paintings? Yes. That's it. I love these questions. Um, so, um, so in Persian miniatures and often in manuscripts, there's there's an element of the frame and sometimes like a, a whole different story is being told in the frame. I was thinking in like illuminated manuscripts. Um, and so I just, I love, I love when li there's little like details that kind of like catch your eye and where something's like, if there's like a pattern that's repeating then something has just shifted a little bit. So you're like, oh, what just happened there? So. I, um, in Persian miniatures, I'm always drawn when there's like a tree that's overgrown the, the frame. Um, and then I was thinking sort of, I was thinking about um, sort of religious icons and objects that, that are um, sort of used in a utilitarian way and sort of like almost as like a practice of worship. Um, so I was thinking about a lot of times like manuscripts will have these frames, icons will have sort of gold around them and frames. And um, there was just, there's so much gold uh, in in the artwork around when, when I was little in Costa Rica. And so it just like, I just remember seeing like icons and then there would be like a golden crown or something gold in the background and like people like, my mom would wear like a golden necklace or gold pendants. And so it, it just harkens um, back to sort of this like early childhood uh, aesthetic um, that was very, very, for me, very connected to my, to my mother's country and place and like very different from the kind of aesthetic of my dad's world. You know, the gold was not like not in my dad's world. So, so the, the gold brings that up for me. And then I think it also, um, also, on a more violent way, you know, connects to the history of um, extraction of minerals in the Americas, like in the colonial period. So, so it's kind of both. It's kind of both at once. That's great. Um, okay, I'm I'm slow to the questions because I'm reading and listening. So I apologize. Oh no. Don't okay. Worry. Um, the next question is from Virginia. Where did you source your images? The fruit company references of men's men doing activities and just in general. I, I like I loved it when you mentioned like the Estee Lauder flower because it seems like you're pulling from all the, the flower that you use. So could you talk a little bit about where you get your imagery? Yes. Um I look everywhere from for images and I kind of think of the paintings as collages um, I, I'm constantly looking at things and um, I feel like I feel like just sort of trusting what your own eye is drawn to because there's something there's some there, for some reason you're just like compelled to like like right now during the quarantine I've been obsessed with like English country houses <laughs> and it's just like really soothing and I just keep looking at them and I can just show you like really briefly I've been like working on this painting and like so many of the fabrics are just are from woo are from like pictures online of like English country houses. And I was like, okay, you know what? I guess I just have to trust that, that like my subconscious like really needs to see that. I find it like very soothing right now. Um, so just like kind of trusting like what whatever it is that you're, that that you just need to look at for, for some reason. And then just like, that's, that's the language that's, that's the visual language that's speaking to you right then. And like sort of the reasons behind it kind of like bubble up on their own, I guess. That's a great answer. Um, do you do you ever paint something in and then and then sort of remove it from the painting? Do you try things that don't work? Oh yes, a lot. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Lots of things don't work. I always like I probably redo the faces like ten times. Right. Um, 
my husband's always like, why are you doing the face again? I thought it was done. I'm like, this is just, it's not working. <laughs> so there's a lot of like removing and putting back in and removing and, and putting back in. Yes. Um, so Jay Lynn wants to know, is there a specific reason why you paint human figures in a more realistic or representational style and the background has a more painterly or loose kind of touch? That's a really good question. Um, I, there's not like a specific reason for it. It's just sort of uh, what my hand has been drawn to do. I think like, you know, early on, I sort of experimented with those like flattened head honcho figures. Um, and maybe I'll like move back towards that. I've, I'm not sure, but for, yeah, I've just, you know, a, a thing that I often do when I'm painting is I'll look at something that I like really want to learn how to paint. And I kind of like tr almost treat each painting obviously as like a diary, as a journal, as an exploration, but then also as like an opportunity to learn something new. So I'll be like, like, I'll look at something. I'll be like, I don't understand how to paint these. Like, I'm going to like, I'm going to give myself this morning and I'm like going to try to work on knees and like looking at different knees and trying to paint that. And so it kind of, it's almost like, um, you know, each painting is, is like a chance to try to learn something new or struggle through something. Um, so I, I just try to really trust my, my, what my hand wants to do and what my eye wants to see and practice and, right. and just like see what happens from that. But I think the thing that's interesting about what you're saying is that you have, like, you want to figure it out. So you're like finding these new challenges to work into the painting, which I think is really interesting rather than just repeating, you know, something that you've done already. Yeah. So, great. It's like a balance because it's like, if I just try to jump into something that's totally different from anything that I've been doing, I might get freaked out and be like, I have no idea what I'm doing. So it's sort of like a balance where it's like, I'll have some things that I'm like, oh, I know how to like kind of structure things like this, but then, um, but then like getting to use like so slowly it changes, like getting to like, you know, try something completely different. And like, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't work. And just being very um, forgiving about it when it doesn't work out. What, what about your palette? I, I've noticed that you have kind of a limited palette or, or you'll have like two, like pink and blue or uh, blue and gold. Can you talk a little bit about your palette choice and where it comes from and what your thoughts are? Yes. Thank so, um, so, well, I love Vera's palette and she was using a lot of pinks in her palette at one point. And I was like, I just love all those pinks. And um, my Tia Sylvia came to visit me and I was like so snoopy because I like she's like my aesthetic icon obviously and so I was like looking like just at the little corner of clothes hanging out of her suitcase and I remember she had like all of these different layers of purple and she had like purple suede pants and like purple matching tops and she put the whole outfit on and like amethyst earrings and an amethyst necklace and I was like I think I want to do like try for a couple of years to just like really pare down the palette so I think it was like about three years that I was trying just to do like pink and blue and purple um with gold and it was like very much in homage to her style, <laughs> her clothes, so. So interesting. Okay, well, one last question for you, if that's okay. One thing that we, we like to ask at the very end when we have visiting painters is tell us about like a, a regular day for you. Like how, when you get to the studio, what's a working day like if you could just describe it? Completely, um, yes, so. Uh, so on a studio day, I usually have to drop off my kids at school um, or at daycare. Um, then I get to the studio. I love, I usually listen to audiobooks when I'm painting. And if I have like a book I love, then I'm like really active painting. And if I have a boring book, I'm like, I think I'm going to go down and like find something in the refrigerator again. <laughs> so, um, so I usually listen to audiobooks and then I just, um, sit and paint and then um I have to pick up the kids at three so that's when I stop the day I have like breaks snack breaks um and then I try to exercise at some point in the day and sometimes I'll paint in the evening if there's if I'm like really into something right that's great 
Well, Larissa, thank you so much for spending this day with us. Our students are really like looking forward to getting to meet with you in the afternoon. And that was a very inspiring talk. And to quote one of the students from earlier today, like after hearing you talk and stuff, it just makes me want to go get to work in my studio. So very inspiring. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I've loved meeting with your students and getting the chance to be here. So. Okay. Well, we'll talk again soon. Bye, Larissa.